Hi everyone, my name is Renee, Program Officer with EcoSchools Canada. On behalf of EcoSchools, thank you for viewing this webinar as part of the 2023 Eco Summit. I'm pleased to introduce Erin Silver, children's author, to present this webinar, Sustainable Transportation, Navigating Our Global Traffic Jam. Erin Silver is the author of several books for children, including middle grade nonfiction, fiction, and picture books. Her most recent nonfiction title is Rush Hour, Navigating Our Global Traffic Jam, about the impact of traffic on people and the planet. Another climate title, Good Food, Bad Waste, Let's Eat for the Planet, will be available this spring with several more books on the way. Erin has also written articles for major magazines and newspapers across North America. She's a member of many professional associations and holds a degree in journalism and an MFA in creative nonfiction. Visit her online at erinsilver.ca. We would like to acknowledge that the Eco Summit has been made possible with support from Natural Resources Canada. We're glad to have you join us for this presentation, and now I'll pass it over to Erin. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here today to present my latest book, Rush Hour, Navigating Our Global Traffic Jam. Um, I've done several books about climate change. I feel this issue is so important. We're facing a climate emergency, and you guys are the generation that's going to make a difference and hopefully turn things around. Uh, so speaking of turning things around, I'm going to share my screen with you. I have a presentation that I've prepared prepared and um, I look forward to presenting my book. So Rush Hour, Navigating Our Global Traffic Jam. First of all, a bit about me. This was me when I was in grade two. So how it began. I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I loved writing stories. And um, as I grew up, I loved writing essays and doing creative writing classes. And I never imagined that one day I'd have books published, but that was always my dream from a very young age. Um, so as I grew up, I went to journalism school. I wrote for school papers. I went and I did a master's. And this is me now. This is how it's going. So these are some of my other titles. I always choose books that I feel are important. I especially like writing nonfiction. So that's where you get to do some research and interview experts because I'm not the expert. I just like to bring important topics to life and present them to kids your age. So one of my books, Proud to Play, about the experience of LGBTQ athletes in Canada. What Kids Did, a picture book about how kids around the world helped others during COVID. I do also have a fiction, um, so a novel. Um, but right now, I've been doing um, a bunch of books about climate change. It's an issue that's become so important to me. And the more I research, the more I want to research. So this one is all about traffic. Um, I have one about um, food waste that's coming up. I have one about disposable culture that's also coming out in the next few years. And also one about sustainability and sports. So I've become a bit of an expert uh, myself, and I'm so excited to be sharing this book with you today. But first, a bit more about me. This is me and my dog Piper and her brother Jet. Um, I like taking them for walks. It's where I do a lot of my thinking about books. Um, I take a notebook or email myself. Um, but you know, getting some time away from my desk is a good way to get inspiration. And these are my kids. They're actually about your age, grade seven and eight. Um, they also inspire me because I like to know what they're thinking about, reading about, concerned about, what their friends are talking about. So I get a lot of ideas through um, through them and they're your exact age. So I'm really excited to have a book that they can read and that I can share with you too. So I know I have a license to drive. You don't have a license to drive, but you do have a license to drive change. And I know my kids would groan at that joke. So you probably will groan as well, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, this presentation is all about traffic. What it is, check. How it begin, check. Why traffic is a problem for people and the planet. Solutions that are taking place around the world. Uh, what solutions are going to look like in the future? What traffic will look like in the future? And most importantly, what you can do to help. Because you think you might not be able to do anything because you don't drive, but actually there is so much you can do at this age without a license. So um, first of all, why I wrote this book. Um, I noticed a problem. 
I was frustrated. I was curious. I began to do my research. Uh, I want to read to you the introduction to my book so you get a better sense of exactly what was going on when I had the idea for this book and also to set the stage. So this is the introduction and I'm going to read it to you. Red taillights as far as I could see all the way up the highway. They blinked and flashed as drivers hit their brakes. Stop, creep forward, stop, creep forward again. My son squirmed in the back seat. Mom, I'm going to be late. At this rate, there was no way he'd be on time for baseball practice, and there was nothing I could do. I was stuck in rush hour on Canada's widest and busiest highway. We'll never make it on time, I muttered. Everywhere I looked, as far as I could see, there were cars, sport utility vehicles, trucks, and buses. I was stuck behind a long orange school bus that belched a big black cloud of exhaust right onto my windshield. That bus is disgusting, said my son as the dark haze engulfed our car. If I could see the smog from a bus and a nearby truck and an old sputtering car just up ahead, imagine all the pollution I couldn't see. Rush hour was bad for baseball, but how were all these idling cars affecting our health? We made it to baseball practice. We were late, but at least my son got some time at bat. All of that traffic congestion made me think. There are a billion cars driving on roads all over the world. In some countries, pollution from cars, trucks, and school buses makes the air so unbreathable that kids can't play outdoors. The chemicals released from our vehicles also hurt our planet. Transportation, especially personal vehicles, is now the leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions in many cities all over the world, and we're all contributing to the problem. You can't drive a car. You don't decide what car your family buys. You can't make sure that school buses aren't clouding the air with soot. But kids are facing an environmental crisis unlike anything we've seen before. This is the time to start thinking about changing our habits and making healthier decisions. One day, rush hour readers will be able to drive, but I hope that by then, maybe you won't want or need to drive as often. Maybe you will have found a better way. So that's what this presentation is all about. I noticed I was stuck in traffic. I was so frustrated because I was late and everywhere I looked, there were cars and pollution, so much of it. And as a writer, I like to think, um, if this is a problem here, what's it like for everyone else? And so I started Googling, um, you know, Googling, is traffic a problem? Why is traffic a problem? And I quickly realized there wasn't a book about traffic. Uh, so I, uh, the process is I think of an idea, I do research, I put together a proposal, and then I send it off to different publishers. Uh, and I found a publisher, which is Orca, and um, they're a great publisher. They love to do these titles about climate change and issues that are important. Um, and also that show um, how kids can have an impact. So I pitched the book to them. They were interested. It took many years to research and write and to finally have copies in my hand. Um, but that's how ideas start. I noticed a problem. I was frustrated. I Googled. Uh, so I also have a video that I want to play. It's I was filmed last winter in my car that explains a bit more about why I wrote this book. Hi, I'm Erin Silver. I'm a children's author and my latest book is called Rush Hour, Navigating Our Global Traffic Jam. And that's why I am doing this video from my electric car. I was inspired to write this book one day when I was taking my son to baseball practice and he was late for practice because I was stuck. I looked around and there were cars everywhere and I started wondering where did this traffic start? What's it like in other countries? And why is it, um, what are the solutions? And is it good for the planet or bad for the planet? So I started to do some research and this is what I've ended up with. It's all about why traffic is a problem for people and the planet and different solutions for how people around the world and governments and countries, how we're all dealing with it. So I know you can't drive, not yet at least, but maybe by the time you are old enough to drive, you won't want to or need to as often. So I hope you read this book, Rush Hour, 
and learn about all the ways you can make more sustainable transportation decisions. So uh, visit my website at erinsilver.ca to learn more. So this book is divided into four chapters. The first chapter is traffic and why it's a problem. So I'm not gonna read it word for word. I'll go over the highlights. Hopefully there'll be a copy in your library or in your classroom that you can pick up if you wanna learn more. Um, but usually, especially if I'm doing a presentation that's interactive, I like to talk to um, students and ask them questions. Uh, so have you ever been stuck in a traffic jam? And I'm sure the answer is yes. Uh, we've all been stuck in a traffic jam, especially if you live in a busy city. Um, and it feels frustrated, frustrating. Um, I've spoken to a lot of kids. They also hate being late. Uh, they like to get to their activities on time and they don't like waiting because uh, that's very hard to do. And when they look out their window, kids describe the smell. It's gross. They have to do up their windows. Uh, there's black smog. Um, there's pollution, we can see it. And there's also a lot of pollution and a lot of toxins that we can't see, but are actually coming out of our exhaust pipes and polluting the air. Um, the problem with emissions, why it's bad for our health, the toxins get into our lungs. So we can't breathe very well, especially in certain countries, especially if you have breathing issues like asthma, um, all this pollution is terrible for, for breathing. Um, the gases also rise up and get trapped in the atmosphere and heat up the planet, uh, which is terrible for lots of reasons. It causes all kinds of bad weather problems, um, you know, pollutes our water when it runs off, which means that it starts impacting um, fish and wildlife. And um, basically it's a big problem and it's gotten worse. Um, so how did traffic actually start and how did people get around before there were cars? Um, my kids will tell you that when I was little, this is how we got around, but actually that's not the case. This is a picture from before cars were invented. So before the 1900s, uh, people got around in horses and buggies. And once cars were invented, they were actually started with electric engines, but that didn't take off. The ones powered by gas is what took off. Um, they were easier to build. They came off on assembly lines. And as more and more people could afford cars, they started buying cars. And that led to a lot of changes like the building of roads and traffic signals and stop signs and parking garages and major highways. Um, so the more people who had cars, uh, the more we weren't able to walk to places. They were spread out far apart from each other. People needed cars to get around. So I have a chart uh, that I'm gonna pull up here. Based on this chart, what are the best ways to get around if you wanna reduce your greenhouse gas emissions? So if you don't wanna pollute the atmosphere and contribute to global warming, what are the worst to best ways? So you can see all these passenger trucks, not great. Look at all of our personal vehicles. That bar graph shows um, cars are a big problem. Uh, SUVs are also a big problem. A lot of us have big cars. They uh, take more gas, they pollute more. Um, traveling by plane, not so great either. Uh, but probably the best ways are public transportation. And what's not even on here because it's an even greener way of getting around is walking, taking um, a scooter, or your skateboard or your bicycle. So if you wanna get around more sustainably, this shows the most to the least um, green ways that you can get around. So just something to think about that explains why uh, pollution is so bad. Uh, so that was chapter one. Um, what is going on all around the world? We know traffic is a problem and we know why it's bad and we hear a lot about global warming and the temperature and the atmosphere. Um, so what are some solutions? So I began researching what experts are doing all over the world and what cities are doing to make sure that we're not idling. And idling is what happens when we're stuck in traffic. Our engines are on, we're producing chemicals, but we're not actually moving. So there's a lot of cases where we're idling, and not moving and contributing to traffic. And a lot of cities around the world are trying to address this, pro this problem. So 
smart cities. That's like, um, I interviewed someone and I want to show you a picture. It's hard to see, but I interviewed someone who works in a smart city. That's like the brain of the city that keeps it moving. Um, it manages everything from traffic signals and red light cameras to the signs on the highway that tell you traffic updates. Um, these are called intelligent transportation system, and it's part of what are called smart cities. So they use sensors, data, cameras to be greener, safer, more efficient. So, you know, when you pull up to a traffic light and the traffic light switches because it can sense that there's cars there, there's actually sensors underneath the pavement that tell us, okay, these cars are idling, let's let them go. And the traffic light will turn from red to green to keep traffic moving. So there's also um, cameras mounted all over the place, like a high up on poles so that people who work in these traffic control centers can tell um, when the traffic's piling up. So there's things called loop detectors, video detection cameras, radar sensors, thermal detection cameras. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes to try to keep traffic moving. We also have simpler solutions like carpool and bus lanes. So those are kind of like express lanes. So if you drive in a carpool, so instead of everyone taking their own car, we get together in one car, there's um, special lanes that get you there faster because only carpools and buses can go there. So there's special bus lanes, carpools. In places like Mexico City, there's so many cars all driving at the same time that they have something called alternate driving days. So uh, the, the license plate you get tells you what day you can drive and cars drive every other day. And that's really helped Mexico City reduce its pollution we have things like car sharing and bike sharing. So in your neighborhood, you might've noticed a long row of bikes that you can borrow. So that's a great way to get around. You don't need your own bike. You just um, rent the bike and you can get places without a car. But also things like a zip car. You don't need to have your own car. You can borrow a car or you can share a car. So even things like Uber or Lyft, you don't even have to take a car ride by yourself. You have an option to pick up other people along the way, which is better for the planet. We have things called 20 minute neighborhoods. And I don't know if your neighborhood is a 20 minute neighborhood. Um, it started in Portland, Oregon. And basically it's a neighborhood where everything is built within a 20 minute walk. So you can go to your dentist, your grocery store, your library and your school all within a 20 minute walk. And that's really great because you don't need cars to get around. So the air is cleaner and more breathable. Uh, there's also places that close off roads so that you can have safer, more walkable cities. And I'll show you a slide of that next. And um, building dense cities. So especially in China, they're having new cities built that are built really, really high. So you can put more people in a smaller space and everything is walkable and no um, cars are allowed. So this is called taking back the street. So in Barcelona, Spain, there's car free neighborhoods. So there's no traffic allowed through a neighborhood. You have to go around the neighborhood and that way there's more people walking and playing in the streets. We talked a bit about the high density cities that are being built in China. So um, there's public transportation that connects cities to other cities, but um, that where you live is walkable and everything is within a short distance. We also talked about the 20 minute neighborhoods. Um, there's several cities that have this and you can do everything you need within a walk. Uh, there's places in Paris and New York where they've completely shut down the city to traffic. Uh, so this way, that part of the neighborhood is more breathable too and people can enjoy it. And in places like Colombia and Ethiopia, they have open street days where they shut the street to traffic and people can dance and play in the street and um, and it's safe and breathable. So that's one of the more simple solutions um, that people are doing around the world to um, help combat traffic. Um, there is a chapter as well, chapter three, driving into the future. What do you think traffic's going to look like in the future? Will there be flying cars? Um, I've done a lot of research and spoke to experts about um, what the future could look like. And there's a lot of different solutions people are working on. So self-driving cars, which means maybe, um, well, I have an electric car. That's one of the solutions. So the battery is an issue when it's time to dispose of it. Um, people are working on that as a, as a problem that needs to be solved. But when I drive from place to place, 
um, I produce no emissions. So that's good for the planet. And after doing all this research, when I needed a, a new car and it was time, I didn't couldn't bring myself to get another car that needed gas. So I got an electric car. Um, Self-driving cars aren't quite there yet, but that would be a solution as well for the future where cars can drive themselves. They can take your mom to work and then drop you off at school and come back and park on the driveway. So uh, there's also um, self-driving shuttles. So you don't need a person. It can just pick you up in your neighborhood and take all the kids to school and then uh, be used somewhere else. So we can be sharing and uh, don't even need a driver. So that's something for the future, possibly. There's things called talking cars. Um, that they're working on where we can alert each other. Our cars will talk to each other and say, oh, there's traffic up ahead. Don't go this way, uh, go this other way. And that way we're not all stuck waiting uh, and idling on the road. Um, a lot of places have electric buses, even in Toronto where I'm from, you see a lot of signs on the buses that they're electric. So they get plugged in and they're not producing emissions. China has the most electric buses um, but there's lots of other cities around the world that have electric buses as well. Um, I interviewed someone who works at a car company. They um, 3D print cars. And when you're done driving the car, you recycle it. And all that metal is used to make other things. So that was a pretty cool solution. One other solution that's coming in the future is called the Hyperloop train. That's also a sustainable way of getting around because instead of driving from one city to another and taking hours and um, producing all those emissions, a Hyperloop train has no emissions, it's sustainable and pretty much gets people from city to city at the same speed as a plane. Uh, so I have a video that talks about Hyperloop trains that I wanted to play for you because I thought it was a really cool advance uh, that we can look forward to in the future. So I'm gonna play this video. Hyperloop is a new form of mass transportation that will set the standard for 21st century travel by connecting cities in minutes. It starts with a near vacuum environment inside a tube, which enables high speeds and low power consumption by nearly eliminating aerodynamic drag. Inside that tube, battery powered pods glide at speeds up to 670 miles per hour comfortably, safely, and quietly, using our proprietary magnetic levitation and propulsion. After building and testing the world's first Hyperloop system, we are now focused on our commercial product. The key to our product is guided by a design that is elegant through its simplicity, future-proof due to its modularity, and guided by the principles of this century, not the last. To do this, we've moved levitation, power, and propulsion onto the pod. Our proprietary levitation engines make Hyperloop 10 times more efficient than the world's fastest maglev trains today. The engines contain arrays of electromagnets, which lift and guide the pod within the track. Hyperloop also supports on-demand service and high throughput by having pods travel in convoys. Unlike train cars, pods are not physically connected, which allows for individual pods to have different destinations. Just like a car taking an off-ramp, pods can split off while the rest of the convoy continues on. The absence of moving parts on the track and the advantage of levitation and guidance on top of the pod allows for high-speed switching and convoying to take place seamlessly. These next-generation innovations not only enable ultra-fast speeds, but provide on-demand, direct-to-destination service, carrying tens of thousands of passengers per hour, per direction, at airplane speeds, with zero direct emissions. Fast, effortless journeys that expand possibilities. This is Virgin Hyperloop. Chapter four in this book is about how kids can make a difference. And you might not think that you can make a difference, but you actually can. And for this book, because I don't make things up, I actually do a lot of research um, and talk to kids and schools about how they're helping. 
So some kids have organized a walk or bike to school day. So instead of everyone having their parents drive them to school, there's a special day that they organize where everybody walks or bikes to school. And there's actually um, an international walk to school month and an international bike to school month. And some kids have walked so many miles when you add it all up, it's like walking around the earth. So um, that's a lot of miles. It all adds up. If we all do our part, even just organize one walk to school or one bike to school day a year, it makes a big difference and adds up to a lot of savings in emissions. Um, some schools, especially for younger kids, they organize something called a walking school bus or even um, a biking school bus. And that's when there's a planned route and all the kids walk to school and everyone follows along. So by the time you get to school, you have a walking school bus. Of course, there have to be safety patrols. So other students or cross crossing guards who help students uh, cross the street safely because uh, there's no point walking or biking to school if it's unsafe. Um, Kids in other places have done research. So in London, kids wore a special backpack. They helped become research assistants. Um, so the backpacks measured air quality and kids wore the backpacks on their way to school. And it told researchers and scientists just how much pollution is in the air when kids are going to and from school. Um, and it also measured uh, maybe there's routes that kids can take that are better than others to get to school. So taking back ways instead of major roads, um, it helps kids breathe better. That research that the kids did led to a lot of um, good initiatives to help make the air more breathable. So anti-idling campaigns at school. So in some schools, parents who idled outside the school waiting for their kids, they were given a ticket. Um, kids started using carpooling or public transportation because that is cleaner. Um, you might see signs even outside your own school where there's no car zones, so parents have to drop you off farther from school so that the playground air is safer for kids. Some schools have uh, planted trees or bushes to help absorb the bad air and protect kids um, so that they can play outside more safely. Um, so there's all kinds of solutions that doing some research um, and taking an active interest can really help do. Um, can help make a difference. You can also reduce your footprint at home. So maybe you decide you want to carpool or you want to walk to school and you can tell your parents, I don't need a ride today. I'm going to take the bus. Um, also, though, your parents might not know this, but in cold climates like where I live, a lot of people think they need to let the car run to heat up in the winter. And that's actually not true. You can just get in your car and go and the engine will heat up while it's moving. You don't have to let your car idle for so long. That's um, a way that even more emissions gets into the air. Sometimes parents will stop their car to chat with someone that they see and leave their car running. You can tell your parent, maybe that's not a good idea. Um, even in the drive through um, those are a problem because we're just all waiting in a line to order our hamburgers. And sometimes we pull over and eat our hamburgers in the car while it's idling. These are all things that we can cut back on to reduce our footprint at home. Another thing we can do is tell others. So um, maybe talk to your teacher about starting a campaign at school or printing posters or sharing information with your um, aunts and uncles and other family members who might not know this. Uh, so there's all little things that we can do that add up to make a big difference. Um, another driving joke, steering in the right direction. So things to think about. Um, how do you get to school? Are you walking? Are you getting a ride? Uh, are you taking the bus? Are there better ways to do it? Um, you can also think about why you might be driven to school or why it's easy for you to walk to school. And you can rate your school. Um, is it easy to walk or bike there? Do parents idle outside? And this could get you thinking, like in a school project or as part of this eco summit, uh, maybe there's some changes that you can suggest that will make a difference. Um, and how can you get others involved? So maybe presenting at an assembly or to your class or putting posters 
uh, at school or organizing a walk to school day or maybe planting some extra greenery. Um, so how can you get others involved to reduce your transportation uh, emissions and reduce them so that everyone could be healthier and um, you could breathe easier? So I have some other activities that you can do. Um, how kid friendly is your neighborhood? So this is actually a really cool website. Uh, you can click on this link and it shows surveys. Um, so students have been taking note of what cities are actually uh, walkable. Uh, you can do, um, you can rate your neighborhood and see how walkable your neighborhood is and uh, just gives you lots of ideas for ways that you can reduce traffic, slow traffic down, make your neighborhood a friendlier place so that you want to walk around and bike uh, and that you can more easily. So this is a really great website. They also do school presentations and visits and have helped a lot of um, kids make an impact in their neighborhood. Um, if you want to learn more about climate change, because it's such an important topic and you might have school projects to do, and I know I wasn't able to cover everything in this presentation, but NASA has a really good website also that you can click on. Um, one thing that, that I like to do and that my kids did, and they were surprised to see and compare their carbon footprint. So that's how much of an impact you're making in everyday life. There's lots of carbon footprint calculators online, but this is a good one also. You can click on the link and um, do a test and see what your impact is like. And also think of ways that maybe you can reduce your footprint because um, there's tons of things we can do, even little things like turning off all our lights or turning off the tap when we brush our teeth. There's lots of little things we can do that make a difference. And that's what we should all be trying to do is make even a difference. We can't solve this problem on our own, but if we all do little things together, um, we can impact change. So coming soon. So rush hour is available now, but my next book about food waste is coming out in the spring and it's really important because most of the food waste um, that happens happens in our own home, which means we can do something about it. So in this book, I talk about uh, what food waste is, why it's a problem for people in the planet, and you know what changes are happening around the world and also things that we can do to make an impact. Um, so this is coming out soon. I have more climate change books coming out soon uh, as well. And I'm really excited to be able to um, add to the discussion and uh, offer some of the research that I did and um, hopefully inspire you guys to realize you can make a difference. Um, so I offer lots of different presentations. I love hearing from kids. So um, feel free to say hello. My website is erinsilver.ca or www.erinsilver.ca. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have questions. Um, I love talking to kids. I love talking about climate change and about how I can help inspire you guys to make a change. So thank you so much for being with me today to discuss my new book, Rush Hour, Navigating Our Global Traffic Jam. Um, I hope you go home and uh, talk to your families about how you can all make a difference together. So thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the summit.